reading from Luke 1, verses 68 through 79. You can read along with us if you would like. It says, Blessed is the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets, who have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham, to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the highest, for you will go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the remission of their sins through the tender mercy of our God with which the day spring from on high has visited us to give light to those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. Amen. whose glory fills the skies Christ the everlasting light Son of righteousness arise and triumph for these chains of mine come thou
All right. Well, by way of introduction, I want to kind of talk to you about something that happened to me on Friday, and it was a very interesting situation. Um, at the school where I teach, Midland Classical Academy, we have some other, t- other tutors from that school here today as well, uh, but we had this opportunity to have a professional storyteller come and speak to us. I'll be honest with you, I didn't know there was such a thing. (laughs) I didn't know that that was a career path, that you could be a professional storyteller. But this guy was very interesting. It's what he does for a living. Um, He has these certain stories that he tells, but but the way he tells the stories is is very intriguing. He's also uh, trained in being a mime. So kind of the things that you would think of with a mime and kind of the actions, the ability to move his body to communicate things, he had that. He also sang some um, as he told this story. And it was interesting that kind of the ways that he does things, he would, uh, there would be like trees that speak or a ship that spoke. And he does all of these things to communicate this truth. And the story was all about this ship that had been built um, and it had been uh, stolen and it had been used in the slave trade. It was very, very interesting. It was very intriguing. But here's what happened. Because it's kind of an uncomfortable thing and I haven't ever been a part of something like that, as the man started telling the story, I knew I had a choice to make. Am I going to enter into this man's universe? Am I going to enter into what he, how he tells stories and what he's doing and what he's trying to communicate? Or am I going to stay back from that and just say, well, I'm going to ignore this? So I chose to just enter in. I chose to enter into his universe, and I was blessed by it. I was brought to tears by his story. It was an amazing thing, and this man is a true artist. And so as I kind of thought about that this weekend... I thought about this is really what God calls us to do on a daily basis. God calls us to step into his universe. You see, here's what happens for us in all our different experiences in life. We've kind of created our own universe. We've kind of created our own way of looking at things and what we think is right and what we think is wrong and all that kind of stuff. And and so uh, I was thinking about this some more this week because some kids after school were having a debate about VR, and whether Christians should use virtual reality headsets or not. And it kind of got heated, and I was in the midst of it, and ended up talking with this one few students for about an hour after school about this topic. But then it got me thinking, VR is actually as old as the fall. Because what happens to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 3 is they choose to step into their own universe. They choose to step out of God's and say, I want to make life the way I want it to be. My truth, my reality. And so as we come to the word of God once again this morning, I would ask you, I would ask me to step into God's universe, to step out of your own ways of thinking, your own ways of doing life, kind of the the accretion of these different kind of false choices that we've made out of our life and just say, you know what, I'm going to set all that aside. What does God say? What does his word say? What does he say about reality? What does he say is important, unimportant? Because that's really what I'm called to do as I teach the word of God to you on Sunday morning is to share from God's universe. And what happens if we do that, if we step into his world, then our lives are gonna be changed. Because here's what God will do. He'll start transforming our universe so our universe becomes more and more like his universe. Our reality becomes more and more like his reality. And we know that this is a process. We understand that our whole lives, this is what we do, but the day is coming, please understand, when you depart from this life and you step into the next, you're gonna step into ultimate reality. You're gonna step into, ah, this is the fullness of truth. This is how things were made to be. So it's an exciting time for me, and it's an incredible opportunity for me once again to be able to share God's word with you. Just an incredible privilege that God has given to me literally thousands of times. I've been able to step into God's universe, share that with you, and that's what I hope to do this morning. So as we jump in, let's look at Psalm 129. Look at our first three verses here. Again, we'll be looking at Psalms 129 through 131 this morning. Verses one through three of Psalm 129 reads, many a time they have afflicted me from my youth, let Israel now say. Many a time they have afflicted me from my youth, yet they have not prevailed against me. The plowers plowed on my back and they made their furrows long. And so as we look at this, as we think about this, we understand that Israel had a long history of persecution. That Israel had a long history of being enslaved and it really started in Egypt. When they were enslaved in Egypt, they were mistreated in Egypt, but it didn't stop there. 
We know throughout history, the, the northern kingdom went into you know, captivity to Assyria. The southern kingdom went into captivity to Babylon. We know that during the time of, of Jesus, they were in captivity to the Romans. And, and the list goes on and on. We know about what's happened in this century and the persecution under the Nazis. And, and we, we know what's happening right now with the Israelites and what's going on in the Middle East. We understand this. This is a part of their history. They have a long history of persecution, and that's what's being referred to. So put in your mind, think about it, as these pilgrims are traveling up to Jerusalem to worship the Lord, they're thinking about the things that have happened in their past. And, and you see this, this vivid imagery here, especially there in verse three, the flowers plowed on my back and they made their furrows long, is really thinking about people being whipped across the back um, as they're being persecuted, as they're being enslaved. And so um, what I want to remind you of here as we move into verse four is that there's always hope. Verse four, notice, the Lord is righteous. He has cut in pieces the cords of the wicked. So the people were enslaved, but then they were freed. Okay, that's very important. When you look at the world system and you're frustrated and you're upset and you say things are not as they should be, you know what? Your, your, your frustration is actually showing you there's a, a different universe. Things should be different than they are now. And so when you're in that frustrated place, I would encourage you to go back to Psalm chapter two. Don't go right now, but just remind yourselves of Psalm chapter two. Oh yeah, the nations are gonna rage. The people are gonna plot against God. People are, but you know what? God's not concerned. God's not worried. God's not frustrated. He's gonna overthrow them. We wanna remind ourselves of that. And so what we see here in verse four, that the Lord is righteous. He has cut in pieces the cords of the wicked. It reminds us that the Lord provided many deliverances for the Israelites. And in fact, some of these ascent psalms that we've seen are, were written as the people of, of Judah returned from Babylonian captivity. So this is, this is a, vital, uh, a vital understanding for you and I because you may be in captivity today. You may be in captivity to a health concern. You may be in captivity to a difficult relationship. You may be what, like financial captivity. There may be something in your life and you say, it's always been like this and it's always gonna be like this and there's no hope and we must remind ourselves that that's not true. The day of deliverance is coming. I wanna remind you of Psalm 34 verse 19 that says, many are the afflictions of the righteous. So we'll stop there for a minute. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Not, well, I was afflicted back in 84, but I've been fine since. <laughs> No, many are the afflictions of the righteous. And some of you in this here are saying like, 1984, never heard of that date. It's, it's, uh, it's way before my time. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Notice this though, second half of Psalm 34, 19. But the Lord delivers him out of them all. For the believer, every affliction you will ever experience, the day is coming when God's gonna deliver you out of that. Okay? I've said it many times, I wanna say it again. For the believer, no pain is permanent. For the believer, no pain is permanent. And so it's only one verse. I don't usually have you turn places for only one verse, but I wanna have you turn there because if you have a paper Bible, I want you to see it. If you have a, a, you know, a, a digital Bible, I want you to see it. Would you turn to Revelation chapter 21, verse four? Revelation 21, verse four went back through this verse this week. Uh, I teach a, a senior elective at school, uh, uh, a Revelation class. We've gotten it to Revelation 21. It's been really exciting moving through the book of Revelation with those seniors. But Revelation 21 verse four is my favorite verse from the book of Revelation. Revelation 21 verse four, if you feel the freedom, I'd encourage you to underline it, highlight it, asterisk, memorize it, all of those things. Notice and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Now, please don't look at that verse and say, well, that's a nice thing, and you know, maybe somebody should cross-stitch that on a pillow. You know, that'd be lovely. No, I want you to realize that's your future. If you are a believer, this is your future. You are gonna be in the new heaven and the new earth. And this is gonna be, God is gonna wipe every tear away from your eyes. There'll be no more death in your life or in your loved one's life. There shall be no more sorrow in your life, no more crying in your life. You guys won't recognize me because I won't be able to cry anymore. <laughs> and so the, you, you won't even know who I am. There shall be no more pain in your life and the former things 
will have passed away. That's your future. And so that's something for us to hope in. So as we turn back to Psalm 129, I want to remind you something that we've, we've kind of a common theme in the Psalms. God has delivered us in the past. God is delivering us in the present and God will deliver us in the future. You and I are like those Amazon packages. We're awaiting delivery, right? Now, the day is coming where he's gonna give us that final deliverance. We're gonna be absent from the body and we're gonna be present with the Lord. All right, let's look at here in Psalm 129, verses five through eight. It says, let all those who hate Zion be put to shame and turned back. Let them be as the, as the grass on the housetops which withers before it grows, and with which, with which the reaper does not fill his hand, nor he who binds sheaves his arms. Neither let those who pass by them say, the blessing of the Lord be upon you. We bless you in the name of the Lord. Okay, so what's going on here in verses five through eight? It's really speaking about judgment upon the enemies of God. That those who are the enemies of God Don't let it go well with him. That's what the psalmist is saying. And so what's the principle here? This is an important principle for us. There is no future for the unrepentant. There is no future for the unrepentant. Here's the good news. If a person is unrepentant now, but they repent later, there's a future for them. Anytime a person repents, but a person who is committed to unrepentance, a person who lives their whole life blaspheming the Holy Spirit by refusing to submit to the Holy Spirit's witness of Jesus Christ, there is no hope for them. There's no hope. This is important. We have to understand this because this is gonna propel us to tell people the truth, not to say, well, I'm just gonna kind of go along with this person's false universe. We're gonna say, no, I'm gonna share the true universe, God's universe with them and help them to see reality. So for more on this topic, would you turn to Philippians chapter three for a moment? So I wanna turn uh, to the New Testament, Philippians chapter three. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, or as I was taught it, Gentiles eat pork chops. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. So Philippians chapter three, I want to look at verses 17 through 21. Again, reminding ourselves that there's, there's no hope for the person who's, who remains in their unrepentance. This is what it says. That's what Paul writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Brethren, join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. Awesome. So, so Paul's saying, look at me, look at other believers who are walking in the Lord and you have a pattern. So we're not here to just kind of try to figure it out ourselves. It's like we look at, around in our lives and say, who's somebody who's walking with the Lord, who's, who's kind of out in front of me and I'm gonna kind of do what they're doing. I'm gonna seek to, to walk as they do. And then notice, for many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. So these are different walkers. They're walking the wrong way. They're walking the wide path instead of the narrow path. And so they're enemies of Christ. Notice what Paul says in verse 19. This is, again, the, the no hope for those who, those who remain in unrepentance. He says, whose end is destruction? Whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is their shame, and here's the key, who set their mind on earthly things. Now, there is a false saying that you've heard. Well, that person is so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. That's False. The, apo- uh, sorry, uh, uh, the apostle, C.S. Lewis, <laughs> we'll get to him. He's, he's, a, he's a personal apostle of mine. Uh, but C.S. Lewis, he said this. He said, if you, if you aim for heaven, you'll get earth thrown in. But if you aim for earth, you'll get neither. You see, you can't hold on to the things of this world, but here's what happens. If you aim for heaven, if you make your life about heaven, setting your mind on things above, then guess what? You're gonna be super valuable in this life because you'll be fulfilling Ephesians 2.10. You'll be walking out the good works that God's called you to work out. That's, that's the privilege that you and I have. We have a privilege to make every day count. We have a privilege to walk in those things, but it comes from setting our mind on things above. But if a person sets their mind on earthly things, their God is their belly, their end is destruction, their enemies of Christ, it's not gonna work. And so Paul, in verse 20, notice, he reminds us as believers, we have a different primary citizenship. Our primary citizenship is heavenly. Notice, for our citizenship, he's contrasting himself and us with these unbelievers, our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, 
the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working in, by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. That's exciting. And, and so, you know, it's, it's, it's incredible to think about this privilege that we have as citizens of heaven. I like watching documentaries about world football or what Americans call soccer. You know, and, and so at the beginning of the season or in the summer, what happens is all these people from the city, they line up to get their season tickets. You know, they want to renew their season tickets. They want to be a part of this thing. And I think about how once they have that card, that gives them access into the stadium. It gives them access to those seats. Please understand, you have right now access to heaven. You have a citizenship. You have a heavenly passport. You are a citizen of heaven. You can come boldly before the throne of grace to find, time for, to find help in time of need because Christ has adopted you into his family. That's incredible. That's an exciting thing for us. But, but as, we, as we look at this and think about Philippians 3, verses 17 through 21, what's, what's the distinction? It's where we set our minds. Do we set our minds on earthly things or do we set our mind in heaven because our citizenship is in heaven? That's the key, and that's the change. That's what will cause us to walk in the true universe as opposed to these universes of our own making. Now, I wanna expand on this thought for just a minute on this being a citizen of heaven. It reminds us that this world is not our home. And so I have a couple of slides up here. I'm gonna have a couple of quotes from C.S. Lewis. So the first slide, this first quote of C.S. Lewis, he wrote this, if we find ourselves with a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that we were made for another world. That's the reality. We look around at those people that are rich and famous and all this kind of stuff, and we just, if only I had a chance, my life would be different. If only I had a chance. But we see the end of those people's lives, and we realize it just never satisfies. No matter how popular, no matter how much money, all of those things, it doesn't finally satisfy because God hasn't made us to be satisfied in this fallen world. This fallen world is a training ground where there's things to do here. There's an opportunity for reward here, but ultimately we were made for another world. So if you find yourself in that place today with that divine discontent, and you're just like, these are just not really as they should be. Or at the end of Wednesday night, I should have won the soup cook-off. You know, that all of those things... Realize God is using that to cause you to want heaven more. <laughs> That's what he wants. Now, we have a couple more slides here. I'm going to break into two parts this quote from um, my favorite sermon of C.S. Lewis. It's called The Weight of Glory. This is what he wrote. If we consider the unblushing promises of reward and the staggering nature of the rewards promised in the Gospels, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong but too weak. And then the quote continues, we are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in the slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. So it's this reminder, it's this understanding that all of these things we ask for in this life that God doesn't give us and we get bent out of shape about, God says, you're asking for mud pies. I want to give you something better. I want to give you something greater. I want to give you something that lasts forever, not some temporary thing that you're going to be tired of in 15 minutes. And so it's, so it's important for us to understand this. And as we set our, our mind on things above, if we refuse to settle for these earthly pleasures, then what's going to happen is God is going to connect our heart to heaven and we're going to be different people. We're going to be those people that Jesus talked about in John chapter 7, that out of their innermost being flow those rivers of living water. That's possible for each one of us. As we desire those things above and we ask to be filled afresh with the Holy Spirit, what happens is God is going to use us in this amazing process. So if you would, let's turn back to Psalms, please. And we'll go on to Psalm 130. Psalm 130, we'll look at verses 1 and 2. It says, out of the depths, I cried to you, O Lord, Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. Now that word depths there, it literally means deep waters. So out of the deep waters, it speaks of trials and troubles. 
I don't know if you've, you've ever had that experience. Maybe you were out at the beach and, and you got you drifting a little too far and that feeling of panic of you're in deep waters. Or maybe, you know, you've, maybe it was in a dream. You're in a dream and you're out there in the middle of the ocean all alone, that feeling of panic. That's, the, that's what the psalmist is experiencing right here. Those, those deep waters. And, and so those trials and troubles. And so there's a couple of reminders I wanna bring before you here in Psalm 30 verses one and two. Reminder number one is God's people will suffer. We've talked about that before, but I don't think we can be reminded of that too much if we look at it from the standpoint of I'm gonna suffer, but God's gonna deliver me eventually. I'm gonna suffer, but God's gonna use it for good. Not, remember believer, you're gonna suffer, hate life. <laughs> that's, not, that's not what we're doing. I remind you so much, I remind me so much of, of suffering so that we can just say, oh yeah, this is not something unusual. This is something that we're promised, but God's gonna use this for good. God's gonna work it out. So a reminder that we will suffer. The verse I'll give you, you don't have to turn there, but it's John 16, verse 33. The night before Jesus was crucified, he was giving his disciples some some more uh, exhortation, and he said this, in the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. So Jesus is saying, remember guys, you're gonna have trouble in this life, but guess what? The trouble that you have is in this world, but I'm above the world. Right, I've overcome the world. So he's saying the trouble that you have is on this level, but don't worry guys, I'm above that level. Okay, I'm over that level. And so it's really, really important for us to understand that. Second thing I wanna remind you of from Psalm 130 verses one and two is that it's good to pray when we're suffering. It's good to pray when we're suffering. Now, when we first start suffering, we might kind of just turn inward. Right? We might just be really frustrated and so discouraged and just so worn out and we can't say anything, but we can't stay in that place. We gotta go and say, Lord, I, I need help. Could you, could you, could you help me? And, and don't only pray, God, would you get me out of this, even though we will pray that. Pray, God, would you help me to learn through this? Would you be with me in this? And no matter how long this thing is, would you stay close to me? Right, those are the things that God wants us to do. And I I love this, we saw this before in Psalm 120, verse one. The psalmist wrote, in my distress, I cried to the Lord and he heard me. Okay, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, God hears you when you pray. Let's move on now to verses three and four. It says, if you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. So I love this. I want to talk about a few different elements from these verses. First thing I want to talk about is I think it's communicating to us that God does not fixate on every sin we commit in word, deed, and thought. And, and I thought about this a lot in the last few weeks because we're going through the Gospel of John uh, with my New Testament classes. And it was brought up by a student. We kind of do a Q&A uh, type of format in the class. And basically, the student was asking, did Jesus correct the disciples about everything they did wrong as they walked along? (laughs) And I just, I'd never thought about that. And the answer had to be no. Could you imagine if every single thing the disciples did wrong, Jesus said, you shouldn't have said that. Shouldn't have done that. Nope, not there. You couldn't get anywhere. Now, some of you are laughing because some of you maybe had parents like that. Or some of you have had bosses like that or you had friends like that, that every single thing they gotta tell you why you're wrong. That's not how God does things because God took care of our sins, absolutely. God takes our sins seriously, don't misunderstand me. But, but God is gracious. God is merciful. God is not you know, just waiting for us like some cosmic policeman with his billy club out just waiting to smack us. No, he's a, he's a loving father And a loving father has got to allow his children to to make some mistakes and to come back to him and ask for repentance or to repent and ask for forgiveness, those sort of things. And so it it would be impossible for us to live if every single moment, everything we did wrong, God is just fixating on that, okay? So, so, well, how can God deal with our sin? How, How does he deal with it? Well, he dealt with it at the cross, and so I want to share with you a, an interesting way of looking at it uh, that William McDonald, who is a, a Bible commentator, I love. He's gone to be on with the, he's gone on to be with the Lord now, but he said there's two categories of forgiveness. First category is judicial forgiveness. 
So he believed there's something called judicial forgiveness. In other words, the moment you believe, you're completely forgiven of every sin. That's judicial, kind of like in a, in a courtroom. You're declared not guilty at that moment because you place your faith in Christ. So all your sins, your past sins, your present sins, your future sins, all forgiven in that moment. Now, we can understand that. Probably everybody in this room, oh yeah, judicial forgiveness. I was forgiven at the cross. Okay, we understand that. But we also know that we're called to ask for forgiveness, right? Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. So he put a second category besides judicial forgiveness. He said parental forgiveness. See, what's happened is when we've been judicially forgiven, we've been adopted into the family of God. We're no longer children of the devil, but we're children of God. And so he's become our parent. And so it's not one of these things whenever we sin, he's like, oh, you're out of the family. Okay, back in the family. You're out of the family, back in the family. No, we remain in the family, but he wants us, he knows that our sin, our unrepentant sin causes distance in that relationship. So he wants to bring us back. And so parental forgiveness is for those who've been adopted to the family of God through faith in Christ and they're forgiven of their daily sins as they confess them to our Father. Right, it's been well said. Uh, it's not in my, in my uh, slides, but 1 John 1, 9 is the Christian bar of soap. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's that parental forgiveness. And so what happens, it's that restoration of fellowship with God and his family. Please hear me when I say this. God wants fellowship, God wants fellowship with you more than you want fellowship with him. God wants fellowship with you more than you want fellowship with him. And why that's so good, why that's so important is not to say, oh, I just would want it more. We should all want more fellowship with God, absolutely. But what it is is God's covering all the bases so that you can have as close a relationship with him as, as you want. God's willing to forgive. God's willing to, to, to draw you back near. God's willing to chasten you so you can be brought back in a relationship. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. So judicial forgiveness, parental forgiveness, something for you to consider. Let's move on to verses five and six now of Psalm 130. It says, I wait for the Lord, my soul waits. And in his word, I do hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning. Yes, more than those who watch for the morning. Now, you know that this psalm wasn't written by a teenager because no teenager watches for the morning. <laughs> and uh, teenagers don't want the morning to come. But you know, it's, as we think about this, it's been well said that waiting is the hardest part. And waiting is the hardest part. But, but, but waiting, please hear me, waiting is key if we're to be faithful. You can't be faithful without waiting. You can't be mature without waiting. That's how, that's how God does it. That's how it works. Now, this word wait isn't like waiting in a, you know, in a waiting room for your doctor to come in. Not that kind of waiting. This waiting means to look for, to hope, to expect. So with the psalmist, when he says, like those who watch for the morning, it's, a per, it's the idea of a person who's in a difficult situation. The darkness surrounds them, and they just want the sun to come up. They just want the sun to rise. So that's what our waiting is for. It's looking forward to, it's hoping, it's expecting. So it's important, Christian waiting, please hear me, is an expectant waiting. Christian waiting is not like, you know, I, I'm just doing time. You know, I'm just having to get through this and just another day. No, it's an expectant waiting. It's a patient looking forward. It, it's, it's that idea that when you were young and you looked forward to Christmas and I just can't wait for Christmas to get here. That's Christian waiting. It's looking forward to something that is much better than Christmas. So for more on this subject, would you turn, it's gonna be a tricky one, turn to Titus. So uh, it's a, an, an often overlooked book. A while back, I was, I was looking through books that I hadn't, um, haven't taught through here at this church yet, and I totally forgot about Titus. I was like, oh, there you are. Okay, Titus. I believe after First and Second Timothy. Ah, there it is. Yeah, First and Second Timothy, and then Titus. We're going to look at Titus chapter two, verses eleven through fourteen. Again, this expectant waiting. Okay, this this hoping. Titus two, verses eleven through fourteen. Paul writes. For by the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared for, for sorry for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, 
we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. Here it is, looking, right? So there's that expectant looking, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's a radical phrasing. Because what it's telling us, it's showing us the deity of Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ is fully God. He's truly God. And so, but that's what we're looking forward to. We're looking forward to that glorious appearing. That, that the moment you see Jesus Christ in the fullness of his glory, you're not gonna be thinking about, man, it really stunk when I was in fifth grade and I got bullied. Man, I, I can't believe those hundreds of times Steve went too long in a study. You're not gonna think about any of that you're going, it's all going to be worth it when you see him. For our glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works, speak these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority, let no one despise you. So please understand, you and I, we're looking forward to, we're expectant, not just for stuff or things, but for a person, okay? What makes heaven heaven is God is there. God's manifest glory is there. So, so, so don't think about it only in terms of, okay, well, I'm gonna have a new body and that's gonna be awesome and I'm gonna have these rewards, that's gonna be awesome. No, what's gonna make it the, the, the most awesome is that you're gonna see Christ, and he's gonna speak with you and he's gonna talk with you and he's gonna, he's gonna be with you forever. That's what we have to look forward to. So with this in mind now tied into, let's turn back left just a little bit to 2 Corinthians. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter four, verses 16 through 18. And this, this, this blessed hope, this, this patient endurance, this looking forward to this waiting, what it does for us is it, it is allows us to move through difficulty. It allows us, it, it empowers us not to quit. And so this is exactly what Paul talks about here in 2 Corinthians 4, and Paul suffered a bunch, looking at verses 16 through 18. Therefore, okay, therefore we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing. In other words, our bodies are getting weaker, our bodies are dying, Father time's undefeated, all those kind of things. Our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man, our spirit man, is being renewed day by day. And then verse 17, one of the incredible, incredible promises in the Bible. I would encourage you to, to memorize it, to, to highlight it, to, to, to underline it. it. says, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, or but for the moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. See that C.S. Lewis's sermon I mentioned er earlier was called Weight of Glory, and it was taken from this verse. That's where he got this idea that actually this difficulty, this hardship that we're going through, these painful experiences, God is using that to give us a greater glory when we're with him. That's what he's doing. That, that's what he's doing. And notice verse 18, and here this ties into being, you know, focused on our heavenly citizenship or focused on the things of earth. Look at verse 18. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So these earthly things that people fixate on, they're temporary. They're not worth focusing on. We focus on the eternal. We focus on the Lord. We focus on those things that he wants us to do and that lasts forever. And that gives us great hope, encouragement as we move forward. All right, back to Psalm 130, if you would. Let's look at verses seven and eight. It says, O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy, and with him is abundant redemption, and he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Okay, so the psalmist is exhorting his listeners or his readers to wait hopefully. So he's exhorting them to wait hopefully, but here's the key. You must wait hopefully if you're gonna exhort others to wait hopefully. The best thing that you can do for another person, whether they're a believer or unbeliever, is to actually walk with Christ. To wait hopefully, as you're waiting hopefully, as you're looking forward to, as you're focusing on things above, then what's gonna happen, that's the best thing that you can do for other people. Because they see that and they say, huh, well maybe there's something to this. Maybe there's a, a reason to, to look forward to it. 
Jesus, now, now there's a, the, a bad example of this, was Jesus speaking of the scribes and Pharisees in, in Matthew chapter 23, verse 3. He said this, do not do according to their works, for they say and do not do. The Pharisees and scribes, they were hypocrites. So you and I, let's not be hypocrites. Let's be hopeful people. And you say, well, Steve, you don't know my life and it's just too much and I'm hopeless and, and there's no hope for me. The, if God's still alive, if God's still on the throne, there's hope for you. Okay, there's hope for you. Our hope is not determined by our circumstances. Our hope is determined because we serve an infinite God who rules over the universe. And so because of that, our goal is to say, I gotta step out of the universe of my own suffering and my own pity and my own kind of limitedness. I've gotta step out of that. I've gotta step into God's universe. I gotta see things the way he sees them and I'm just gonna walk by faith. And, and, and if, if that's, if people around me think that I'm crazy, so be it. Paul said, I would rather be a fool for Christ. You and I can be those people. But here's, here's the wonderful thing. As we wait, hopefully, as we seek to walk with the Lord, even though we're imperfect, what's gonna happen is we can actually call on other people to say, hey, follow me. We can be a pattern for people. This is what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 11, verse one. He said, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. Paul sought to imitate Christ, so he says, you imitate me too. And, and here's the thing, remind yourself of this. Hope increases as you set your mind on things above. Hope decreases as you turn on CNN, as you turn on whatever news thing. If you spend all your time, let, as like, let me see the political situation and if it's getting better. It's not, okay? If you set your mind, even as a believer, on the things of this world and the badness of this world and the ugliness of this world and just to kind of see how things are going, you're gonna be discouraged, but here's the thing, if you set your mind on things above, you become encouraged and then you look around you and say, well, this thing is wrong, but now I have the encouragement to do something about it because now the Lord's leading me, the Lord's guiding me. Huh, there's a person at my work that I can see they're going through a really hard time. Now that I've set my eyes on the Lord, I can be the one to pour into their life. I can be the one to say, hey, how are you doing? Uh, can I pray for you? We've got, to f we've got to be in a place where we're in right relationship with the Lord so we can give something to other people. It's been well said, you can't give out what you don't possess. Okay, if, if I'm running on empty because I'm not walking with the Lord, well, then it makes perfect sense I have nothing to give to anybody else. But if I'm walking with the Lord, then I become a fountain instead of a drain. Let's move on to Psalm 131, a Psalm of David. So this is a Psalm of David here, and it's a short one. We're gonna look at verse one, first of all. Uh, we're gonna break it down a little bit. He says, Lord, my heart is not haughty. That word haughty means proud. He says, nor my eyes lofty. That word lofty means arrogant. Neither do I concern myself with great matters. That word concern means to walk in. And he says, nor with things too profound for me. Profound means difficult. Okay, so what's the big idea here from this first verse? It's simply this. David humbled himself before the Lord and David realized that there was no way for him to figure it all out. So, there are unbelievers in this world. They write books and they're popular and all these kind of stuff. And they're going to tell you how everything came to be. They're going to tell you how everything is. They proclaim to tell you what happened 15 billion years ago or whatnot. They don't know because they weren't there. And so it's really important for us as believers to come to a place of humility like David and say, you know what, Lord, here's the deal. I've got to this age, and I really don't know how it's all gonna work out. I don't know how all these things are. I, I don't understand it all. And, and so uh, I would encourage you to remember this verse. It's, it's, it's from the Old Testament. It's, it's quoted several times in the New, but it's simply this. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Here's the good news. If you will humble yourself, God will give you grace. Here's the bad news. If you're proud, if you're proud, you know, intellectually, if you're proud in whatever way, God is gonna resist you. And if God resists you, you're in trouble, okay? You, you, you can't push over God, okay? But if, if we'll humble ourselves, he'll give us grace. And, and so, so here's the important thing to, to understand. Pride holds us back from right relationship with the Lord. And you already know this on kind of a human level. 
when, when someone is prideful, it's hard to have a relationship with them. When, when, when we're prideful, it's hard for people to have a relationship with us. And so if we want to have a greater relationship with the Lord, then we need to humble ourselves. Now, I'm not going to stand here and say to you that I don't know more about the Lord than I did 25 years ago when I first became a believer, because I know a lot more. I know a lot more about the Lord. But here's what I also know is I don't know near as much as I thought I did. <laughs> the, the more I grow in the Lord, the more that I realize my kind of the knowledge I have compared to all the knowledge is infinitesimal. It's very small. But here's the deal. If you want to have a close relationship with the Lord, just humble yourself before him. It's easy. Verse two, surely I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with his mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. Okay, so a weaned child is a child who's no longer breastfeeding. It's a child who's actually eating solid food. And so uh, this, is, this is kind of a poetic David, way of David saying, I'm not a crybaby anymore, <laughs> right? A non-weaned child is a crybaby, right? Crying to be fed. And so he's saying, I'm in a different place. I've matured. God's matured me. I've calmed and quieted my soul. So, so here's the key. How does that tie to verse one? Simply this, humility brings peace. If you and I today are anxious and frustrated and upset and angry, pride is most likely the key. God's not doing things the way I want him to do. I can't believe this person treated me this way. I can't, it's, it's our pride, our pride. But if we would humble ourselves and say, you know what, what do I deserve? I deserve death and hell, that's what I deserve. And so God has given me all these things and so let me just walk in that, let me trust his plan. Uh, and so as I was thinking about this, I, I, was, I, I was brought back to Job. So would you turn to Job for just a minute? Turn left one book to Job 42. So Job 42, as you're turning there, if, you're, if it's been a while, if it's been a while since you've been in the book of Job, Job suffered tremendously. Job suffered pretty much the loss of everything you can lose. Lost his children, um, you know, was estranged from his wife. He, he lost his health. His, his friends essentially turned against him and said, you know, Job, it's your fault. All this is happening. And Job just was, he had enough. He'd had enough. And Job, please understand, was the greatest man of his day. He was a wonderful guy. But he had enough and he just felt like I need to have a time to talk with God. God needs to settle this. I need to tell God my side and God will figure this out. And so things didn't turn out the way Job thought they would. Because when the Lord showed up, the Lord didn't give Job any answers. And the Lord just said to Job, who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? I created you. He says, do you think you know how, and he kind of, he quizzes Job for a few chapters, and Job says, I don't know. <laughs> but when Job gets humbled, please understand, when Job gets humbled, he gets restored. If you and I will humble ourselves from the Lord, he'll restore us. And so I want to read for you Job 42, verses one through six. We see Job's humbling. He says, then, then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do everything and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. You asked, who is this who hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me which I did not know. Listen, please, and let me speak. You said, I will question you and you shall answer me. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. And it's a common thing that people say, unbelievers is like, well, I'm gonna, when I you know, get before God, I'm gonna tell him a thing or two. I'm gonna ask him some questions. I'm gonna tell, you, no, no, you're not. <laughs> Job, the best guy of his day, suffers tremendously more than you and I probably will ever suffer and he gets before God and he realizes, man, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a prideful jerk. And he's humbled, but here's what happens. We're not, we don't have time to get into the rest of this. When he humbles himself, God restores him to fellowship with him. God restores all that's in his house. And then he actually uses Job to be the one to pray for those friends that were a mess. So here's the deal. When God restores you, then God's gonna use you. You humble yourself, God will restore you, and then he'll put you back in the ministry. He'll use you somewhere, and it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. 
And, and so, so the question for us to ask ourselves, a really penetrating question, if we live lives of true humility, what will we lose? <laughs> what are we going to lose? We don't lose anything if we live these lives of humility. One more place I want to have you turn, if you wouldn't mind. It's Matthew chapter 11 this time. Matthew 11, verses 28 through 30, as we near the end of our message here. Matthew 11, 28 through 30, a familiar passage, but it, it reminds us of the importance of humility, and this is, this is vital. God is not asking you to do something that Jesus Christ didn't do. He's not saying, hey, you be humble, but I'm never going to be humble. Jesus humbled himself. And so this is what we see here in Matthew 11, verses 28 through 30. Jesus makes this invitation, makes this offer. He's making this invitation to you and to me today. He says to this, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. How many of us are laboring under our own pride? our own need to be acknowledged, our own need to, to make our mark in this world, to have things go our way. Jesus is saying to us, hey, that's, you're, you're worn out. And so let go of that pride, let the, the, down those things, let go of those expectations, and then here, what does he say? Take my yoke upon you. That's, it's a double yoke. He's saying, be yoked to me. Be in fellowship with me. Be in relationship with me. Come work with me. Notice, and you'll learn from me, for I am gentle. That word gentle means meek, humble. I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. When you and I lay down our pride, and we say, you know, I'm gonna humble myself, I'm gonna be yoked to Jesus, there's rest there. Because you don't have to fight for your name. You don't have to fight for your way. You don't have to look out for number one. And then he says, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It's going to buoy us up. It's going to be something that, that re restores us, empowers us. Beautiful, beautiful thing. All right, back to, if you want to mind, Psalm 131, final verse, verse 3. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forever. I love that. Oh, Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forever. What does this mean? That hope in the Lord should be the unceasing posture of our lives. Hope in the Lord should be the unceasing posture of our lives. Should always, every day should be a hopeful day. No matter what's going on, because remember, we're gonna have this tribulation in the world, but what did Jesus say? I've overcome the world. I'm above the world. I'm above this situation. I'm above this circumstance. I'm, I'm, I'm increasing your weight of glory. I'm working it together for the good. So the, the final verse before we move into our conclusion, I'll read it for you. It's Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23, says this. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope, the confession of our hope without wavering, here's why, for he who promised is faithful. The reason why you and I can rest in hope is because God's faithful. It's not gonna change his mind not going to do something different, have a different plan. He promised this to you, and he's going to fulfill it. The promises of God in Jesus are yes, and in him, amen. So as we close, before we move into our time of communion, I just want to give you three reminders. Number one, for the believer, no pain is permanent. Whatever pain you are enduring now or going to endure in the future, it's not permanent. Revelation 21 verse 4 is in your future. Number two, as believers, we are citizens of heaven and we're to set our mind to things above. That, that's our, our heavenly home. We're, we're gonna be citizens of whatever nation in this world for, and we should be good citizens, but we're citizens for a temporary, an infinitesimal amount of time compared to eternity. And so let's focus on our heavenly citizenship. And then thirdly and finally, as believers, we're to lay down our pride and we're to humbly and expectantly wait on the Lord until the day he takes us home.